<coughs> so uh, welcome folks uh, to this PhD confirmation finale. finale. Um, today uh, being presented by Mariam Rashidi. Now, uh, just a little bit of background about Mariam. Um, she's a, um, a clinician, a uh, medical doctor from Iran, uh, where I met her about four and a half years ago or so. Uh, and Mariam lives in a place in, in Iran called Yazd. Uh, it's a fantastic place. If you ever get the opportunity to go there, ask her for an invitation. Um, it's uh, listed by UNESCO as the second most historic city in the world. Um, guess what the first one is. And it's more than 3,000 years old. It's, um, it's just a remarkable place, remarkable architecture and, of course, people, Persians, Iranians, incredibly friendly and hospitable. In any case, uh, Marian came to the Weihai to do a PhD um, in 2011, and uh, as is sometimes the case, and perhaps with me, often the case, the first year um, was reasonably successful in some ways, but in other ways it wasn't. It was Marian was meant to be looking at the inflammatory effects of food, in particular fructose, uric acid relationships, uh, and after screening the literature and doing a lot of work and um, we figured out that most of what was published was wrong and we didn't want to do that anymore. It wasn't the sort of thing that we wanted to pursue. So Mariam almost independently decided that she was going to work on the topic that she's going to talk about today and for the last two years she's uh, pursued that and I think has done very well. Um, she came into the WeHi without any real lab experience and uh, as James Vince will attest to, uh, and, uh, and John Wentworth, her other supervisors, uh, she's taken, taken to it like a duck to water and done a great job. So we're really looking forward to hearing from you, Marion. Okay, and congratulations, you're nearly there. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Len, for a very nice introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for coming along. Today, I will be talking about Salib CD52 as a potential therapeutic candidate for inflammation-driven disease. So what is CD52? CD52 is a surface GPI anchor glycoprotein, which is expressed by T cells, B cells, monocytes, eosinophil, and macrophages, and to lesser degree by NK cells, plasmocytoid dendritic cells, basophils, and also by epididymal epithelium in the mere reproductive tract. There was some evidence suggested that CD52 can function as a signaling molecule, but precise function of CD52 was unknown until recently. Uh, most of the data for CD52 comes from anti-CD52 antibody, or CAMPAS, which can activate complement-mediated cell deaths and is used for lymphocyte depletion in various types of disease. For example, bone marrow graft to prevent graft versus host disease, several types of leukemias, and also autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and multiple sclerosis. This shows the structure of CD52. CD52 contains a very short peptide, only 12 amino acids in human. Linked at C terminus, there is a complex, um, uh, there is a glycosyl phosphatidyl inositol anchor, and attached on aspargine 3, there is a complex carbohydrate containing silylated polylactosamine unit on a monoscope. A recent work uh, from Harrison Lab by Esther Bandala and others has shown that uh, T cells with high expression of uh, CD52 are immunosuppressive. And suppression mediated by a release of CD52 uh, from the cell surface of T cell after activation by phospholipase C. And the soluble CD52 mediates suppression through binding to Siglec 10. For example, here, T cells were sorted to CD52 high and CD52 low T cells, and when they mixed uh, in one-to-one -one ratio, the um, uh, CD52 high T cells suppressed CD52 low T cells in response to different antigen here 
um, shown by TED Talks, represented by interferon gamma LES spot. And here, just shown that CD52 high T cells release CD52 after activation. As you are aware, inducers of inflammation are divided in two groups. The first and the most potent are pathogen-associated molecular patterns, or PAMPs, like bacterial products. And the second and less potent are damage-associated molecular patterns, like HMG1 and heat shock proteins, which release after cell death. CD24 is another GPI anchor glycoprotein, which is similar to CD52 in some aspect. A recent work from Yang Liu group has shown that CD24, through its interaction with cyclic 10 in human or cyclic G in mice, dampened the host response to tissue injury induced by different damps like HMGB1. While this pathway does not affect the host response um, to PAMPs like LPS or PolyIC. Based on these results, the first question we asked was, does soluble CD52 suppress signaling in innate immune cells? Greatly, as a result of T-cell work, we have recombinant mouse and human CD52, which is an FC fusion protein designed by Yusha Joint. So to test if uh, soluble CD52 induces any suppression in innate immune cells, Monocytic cell line THB1 cells stimulated with TLR4 ligand LPS in the presence of either CD52FC or FC for 24 hours. After 24 hours, supernatant were collected and level of the cytokines were measured in the supernatant by Biopelex. As shown here, exposure of cells to CD52, but not FC, resulted in a dose-dependent inhibition of IL-1 beta, IL-6, and TNF-alpha. Similar pattern was also observed by primary human monocyte, isolated by positive selection using CD14 microbits. CD52 suppressed LPS-induced IL-1 beta release by these cells in a dose-dependent manner. The suppression was not specific to LPS. For example, exposure of THB1 cells to CD52 suppress an IL-1 beta release in response to PAM3Cs, which is TLR1-2 ligand. And also, uh, exposure of cells to CD52 suppress TNF-alpha release in response to different dams like HMG1 and heat shock protein 19, which are ligands for TLR2, 4, RAGE, and in case of heat shock protein 19, CD91. Interestingly, mouse uh, CD52 exerts similar suppressive effects. For example, exposure of mouse bone marrow drive macrophages to CD52 suppressed TNF alpha release in response to PAM3Cs, and also suppressed TNF alpha release in response to LPS or TLR9 ligand CPG by mouse bone marrow drive disease. James found the same suppressive effect in response to inflammasome activating agent. Here, fetal river derived macrophages, when exposed to CD52, the level of IL-1 beta release significantly suppressed in response um, to inflammasome activating agent like ATP nigerisin alum after LPS priming. Interestingly, mouse and human CD52 exert similar suppressive effect. For example, here, human monocyte exposed to different concentration of mouse CD52, and here, mouse bone marrow drive macrophages exposed to different concentration of human CD52, and both exert the same similar suppressive effect. Next, we ask, is this uh, suppression specific to CD52, or is it a general feature of all GPI anchor glycoprotein? CD24 is another GPI anchor gly glycoprotein, which is similar to CD52. To test this possibility, THB1 cells exposed to either CD52FC or CD24FC in presence of LPS. After 24 hours, we measured the level of the cytokine in the supernatant. As expected, CD52FC suppressed LPS-induced cytokine release significantly, while CD24FC had no suppressive effect, which suggests that this effect is specific to CD52. 
CD52FC was engineered to contain a factor 10 protease site between CD52 and FC fragment to exclude the possibility that CD52FC induced a suppression through binding to FC receptors, the FC fragment was killed by factor 10 protease. And CD52 lacking FC suppressed LPS induced IL-1 beta release similar to CD52FC. Moreover, pre-incubation of cells with FC blocking reagent did not alter the suppression, which suggests that the suppression is not due to binding to FC receptors. To summarize this part of the talk, Salib CD52 suppressed cytokine secretion by innate immune cells in response to several dams and pumps. Mouse and human CD52 exert similar suppressive effect and the suppression is specific to CD52 and is not due to binding to FC receptors. This result uh, led us to uh, ask the next question, and the question was, what's the mechanism of suppression? And in this context, two main points were cellular receptor for soluble CD52 and also signaling pathways underlying the function of CD52. Going back to the structure of CD52, as I mentioned before, before, peptide portion of CD52 is very small, only 12 amino acids in human and 25 in mouse. And the major component of the molecule is enlink glycan. It has been suggested that the peptide portion of CD52 is primarily important for attachment of enlink glycan to GPI anchor and hence plasma membrane. So it is unlikely to have a role beyond purely structural. Moreover, it is possible that enlink glycan of CD52 is the most important feature of the molecule regarding to its possible interaction with other molecules. To test this possibility, the enlink glycan of CD52 was cleaved by glycanase F. A removal of the glycan was confirmed by STS page analysis and commercial blue staining, which showed reduction in molecular weight of CD52 following the glycosylation. And indeed, removal of the glycan abrogated the suppressive effect of CD52 on LPS-induced IL-1 beta release. Moreover, a non-glycosylated peptide portion of CD52 had no suppressive effect. This data suggests that the enlink glycan of CD52 is important for the suppression. Enlink glycan of CD52 contains galactose and acetylgalactosamine, focus, and terminal sialic acid. Terminal sialic acid on glycan can be important regarding to their potential ability to mediate interaction with other molecules. They can be recognized as ligand by lectin receptors. To test if sialic acid is important for suppressive effect of CD52, we cleave uh, sialic acid using sialidase or noraminidase. And removal of sialic acid also abrogated the ability of CD52 to suppress LPS-induced IL-1 beta release, which suggests that sialic acid is critical for suppressive effect of CD52. And as I mentioned before, sialic acid can be recognized by lectin receptor called sialic acid IgG-like lectin or Ciglex. Ciglex are the best characterized lectin receptors. They are displaying an amino terminal V2-set domain which can bind to sialic acid and a variable number of C2-set domain. According to their sequence similarity and evolutionary conservation, they are divided in two different groups. The first group, which is highly conserved between mammals studied so far, includes siloadhesin, CD22 or Ciclec2, MAG or Ciclec4, and recently discovered Ciclec15. And the second group are CD33-related Ciclecs, which are nine in human and five in mice. CD33 latest Ciglex are highly variable between mammals. Because of that, they have different nomenclature. CD22 and CD33 latest Ciglex has got immunoreceptor tyrosine-based inhibitory motif or item in their cytoplasmic domain. And classically, receptor with item function as inhibitory receptor. They can dampen activating signals through recruitment of tyrosine or inositol phosphatases.
Several work from different groups has shown that cichlids are negative regulator in innate immune system. For example, cichlid 9 overexpression in macrophage cell line results in reduction of TNF alpha release in response to different stimuli, including LPS, CPG, or double stranded RNA. Antibody crosslinking of cyclic E, mouse homologue of cyclic 9, on bone marrow derived macrophages suppress a cytokine response in response to LPS. And cyclic G deficiency uh, in, uh, induce higher um, pro inflammatory cytokines and enhance lethality in a model of mouse liver necrosis. Cyclic H crosslinking on plasmocytic dendritic cells reduce TNF alpha release in response to CPG. And also, anti cyclic F antibody, mouse homologue of cyclic 8, reduced airway inflammation in over challenged mice. Based on this result and also the result of T cell work, we aim to test if soluble CD52 interact with any of the cyclics in innate immune cells. For that, lysate of THB1, or primary human monocyte, incubated with human CD52FC or FC, and precipitated by protein G sepharose beads. The precipitated protein probe with different cyclic antibodies. We could detect the interaction of human CD52FC with cyclic 10, but not with other cyclics. Moreover, removal of the silic acid or N-link glycan abrogated this interaction. The bottom panel shows the uh, success of IP. For example, this one is CD52, and after treatment with PNGS, the molecular weight of CD52 reduced following the glycosylation. We also verify this interaction through reciprocal IP, in which lysate of THB1 cells incubated with cyclic 10 FC precipitated by protein G sepharose beads and precipitated protein probe with CD52. And we could uh, detect the interaction between cyclic 10 FC and CD52. And the bottom panel shows the success of IP. This is cyclic 10 FC and this is just input cyclic 10. We also try to determine the uh, receptor of soluble CD52 in mouse cells. For that, we um, use a lysate from bone marrow derived macrophages incubated, incubated with human CD52 FC or FC, then uh, precipitated by protein G sepharose beads and the precipitated protein probe with cyclic E and G. And we could uh, detect the interaction between cyclic E and uh, human CD52 FC. So together, this data suggests that uh, human CD52 interact with cyclic 10 in human cells and cyclic E in mouse cells. According to this, we propose that soluble CD52 bind to the cyclics, which result in recruitment of phosphatases, like SHIP-1, SHIP-2, or other phosphatases, and in turn phosphatases dampen, dampen the activating signals from the receptors with immunoreceptor tyrosine-based activatory motif. Because um, all TLR and TNF receptors activate nf cov pathway to produce cytokines, next we investigate if soluble CD52 can inhibit nf cov pathway to limit cytokine production. For that, we made uh, nf cov reported THB1 cells. So THB1 cells were transfected with a lentiviral plasmid harboring a promoter containing nf cov binding site upstream of GFP. So when cells exposed to a nf cov activating agent like LPS, GFP expression is an efficient readout for nf cov activation. To test the effect of CD52 on these cells, and these cells exposed to CD52 or control, in this case PBS, in presence of different PAMPs and DAMPs for five hours. After five hours, cells were harvested and analyzed by flow. First, to exclude uh, dead cells, we gated on annexin 5 negative, PI negative cells, and then we look at the expression of GFB in this population. As shown here, 
CD52 significantly inhibit NF-CoV activation represented by mean fluorescent intensity of GFP in response to different stimuli like different PAMPs, LPS, PAM tristes, and also different DAMPs like HMG1 and heat shock protein 19, and also TNF alpha and IL1 beta. To investigate the effect of CD52 uh, in specific markers of transcription factor activation, including LPS-induced phosphorylation of NF-CoV, ERG junk, and MAP kinase pathway, we used uh, bone marrow drive macrophages. We exposed them to CD52 or control for 15 minutes, and then stimulated with LPS for different time point. After the indicated time point, cells were harvested, washed, and lysed, and used for immunoblood analysis. As shown here, exposure of cells to CD52 delayed phosphorylation of NF-CoV P65 upon LPS stimulation, and also uh, alpha alpha degradation, as well as ERG phosphorylation. In contrast, exposure of cells to CD52 increased phosphorylation of P38 and junk. Together, this data suggests that CD52 may limit cytokine production through inhibition of NF-CoV and ERG pathway. To assess the involvement of phosphatases like SHIP-1 in CD52-mediated suppression, we use a SHIP-1 inhibitor SSG. For that, THB1 cells exposed to SSG for 24 or 48 hours and then exposed to CD52FC or control in presence of LPS. Then the level of the cytokine were measured in the supernatant. As shown here, SHIV-1 inhibitor SSG did not alter CD52-mediated suppression after 24 or 48 hours. We also investigate the involvement of SHIP-1 by using bone marrow drive macrophages from SHIP-1 mutant mutate and mice. So the cells um, are stimulated with LPS, and we look at the level of TNF alpha. As shown here, again, CD52 suppress LPS induced TNF alpha release by these cells similar to wild type. However, generally mutate and mice release less TNF alpha in response to LPS. SOX3 contains SH2 domain, which has homology with N-terminal SH2 domain of SHIP1 or SHIP2 with the same binding specificity. There are some evidence suggested that CIGLEX can uh, mm, uh, induce inhibition by recruitment of SOX3, which compete with SHIP1 or SHIP2 to bind to phosphorylated item of CIGLEX. To test if SOX3 is involved in CD52-mediated suppression, we tested the effect of CD52 on SOX3-deficient bone marrow drive macrophages. And again, CD52 suppressed LPS-induced TNF alpha release by these cells similar to wild type. So together, this data suggests that SOX3 and SHIP1 may not be involved in CD52-mediated suppression. So to summarize this part of the talk, salylated L-link glycan is required for the inhibitory effect of CD52. Human CD52FC interacts with CIGLEC10 in human and CIGLEC-E in mouse innate immune cells. CD52 CIGLEC inhibits NF-CoV and ERG activation to suppress cytokine production. And CD52 is unlikely to signal via SHIP1 or SOX3. Induction of cell death may represent another mechanism by which soluble CD52 uh, induce suppression of cytokine production. Accordingly, we ask, does soluble CD52 inhibit pro-inflammatory cytokine production by induction of cell death? To answer these questions, THP1 cells exposed to different concentration of either CD52FC or FC in presence of LPS. After 24 hours, supernatant were collected to measure the level of the cytokine, and cells were harvested and stained by PI. 
As shown here, high concentration of CD52 surprisingly induced significant cell deaths represented by percentage of PI positive cells, <coughs> while low concentration of CD52 in which there is no significant cell death with uh, FC control suppress IL-1 beta release significantly in response to LPS. So this data suggests that high concentration of CD52 induce significant cell deaths, while no, low concentrations do not cause cell deaths, but still suppress cytokine production. The cell death was specific to CD52 because when CD52 depleted from a stock solution by using protein G sephirose beads, the stock solution no longer induced cell deaths. Moreover, CD52 lacking FC induced cell death similar to CD52 and cleavage of the carbohydrate abrogated the cell death. And also, high concentration of CD24, even after 24 hours, did not induce cell death. There are some evidence suggested uh, enhanced cell death by cyclic ligation. For example, cyclic 8, cyclic 9, or their mouse homologs cyclic E and F in innate immune cells. The mechanism how cyclic induced cell death is not clearly identified. However, ROS production is one of the mechanisms suggested to be involved in cyclic induced cell death. For example, uh, cyclic 9 ligation on neutrophils can induce massive ROS production and cell death. And neutrophils from the patients with uh, CGD who have a defect in ROS formation do not undergo apoptosis under uh, cyclic 9 ligation. However, this pattern is not consistent between all of the cyclics. For example, exposure of murine eosinophil to cyclic F does not induce ROS, and despite the lack of ROS, these cells underwent apoptosis upon cyclic F ligation. Having shown that high concentration of CD52 can induce cell death, next we try to find the mechanism by which soluble CD52 can induce cell death. At the first step, we use two different inhibitors, QVD, which is a pan caspase inhibitor with a potent anti-apoptotic properties, and NEC1S, which is an inhibitor in necroptotic pathway. So cells uh, pre-incubated with these inhibitors and then exposed to high concentration of CD52. After 16 hours, cells were harvested and analyzed by flow by annexin 5 PI staining. Phallocytometric analysis using annexin 5 PI staining showed that when cells were incubated with QVD, CD52 induced cell death significantly reduced, while NEC1S had no effect on cell death, which suggests that CD52 at least in part induces caspase dependent apoptotic cell death. As you know better than me, there are two apoptotic pathways. Intrinsic apoptotic pathway, which can initiate by cellular stress, like chemotherapy, radiation, and growth factor withdrawal, which can activate BH3-only family protein, back and backs activation, mitochondrial membrane permeabilization, and cytochrome C release. Cytochrome C bind to the IPAF and induce apoptosome formation. Apoptosome trigger caspase 9, caspase 9 cleaves, and activate downstream caspases to induce apoptosis. Extrinsic apoptotic pathway initiates by ligation of these receptors to their cognate ligand, and downstream events can activate and cleave caspase 8, and subsequently caspase 8 activate and cleave downstream caspases to induce apoptosis. Moreover, caspase 8 can cleave bead, and truncated bead can activate intrinsic apoptotic pathway. Next, we try to investigate uh, if CD52 induced cell death trigger intrinsic or extrinsic apoptotic pathway. We investigated this by uh, testing the involvement of caspases by immunoblood analysis. For that, bone marrow drive macrophages exposed to different concentration of CD52 and with high, with high concentration and with pre-incubation with QVD. After six hours, cells were harvested, washed, and lysed, and used for immunoblood analysis. 
Notably, both caspase 8 and 9 were cleaved to their active fragment upon CD52 exposure in a dose-dependent manner. Moreover, consistent with phyllocytometric analysis, QVD abrogated the cleavage of caspase 8 and PARP upon CD52 exposure. This data suggests that CD52-induced cell death can activate both uh, uh, caspase 8 and 9. We also uh, investigate the requirement of caspase 8 in CD52-induced cell death by using caspase 8 deficient cells. Because caspase 8 mice are deficient mice are embryonic lethal, we use bone marrow derived macrophages from caspase 8 RIP3 double knockout mice, and we use wild type and RIP3 as controls. As shown here, high concentration of CD52 induces significant cell death in wild type and RIP3 knockout bone marrow derived macrophages, while CD52 induced cell death significantly reduced in caspase 8 RIP3 double knockout bone marrow derived macrophages. We also investigate the kinetic of CD52 induced cell death versus inhibition of NFKV pathway by um, immunoblood analysis. For that, again, bone marrow derived macrophages exposed to CD52 or controlled for 15 hours, then stimulated with LPS for different time point. After indicated time point, cells were harvested, washed, analyzed, and used for immunoblood analysis. Inhibition of NFKB re represented by delayed phosphorylation of NFKB P65 and also uh, alkabab alpha degradation happens within 15 minutes of CD52 exposure, while cleavage of caspase 8, PARP, or caspase TLE were evident within two hours of CD52 exposure. So this data suggests that, first of all, inhibition of NFKB happens very early and also is uh, not due to cell death and caspase cleavage. We also could not detect truncated bead after CD52 exposure, which suggests that CD52-induced cell death does not trigger intrinsic apoptotic pathway through bead. We also investigate the um, in, uh, in NFKB inhibition and cells, cell deaths together by using NFKB reported THB1 cells. So the cells are perincubated in the presence or absence of QVD and then exposed to high concentration of CD52 in presence of LPS for different time point. After indicated time point, cells were harvested and analyzed by flow. First of all, we found that CD52-induced cell death was evident within four hours of CD52 exposure and was more significant in further time point. And QVD significantly reduced CD52-induced cell death. Looking at annexin 5, PI negative cells, we found that QVD had no effect on CD52-mediated inhibition of NFKV pathway which this again suggests that CD52-induced cell death is not responsible for the inhibition of NFKV and cytokine inhibition. As I mentioned before, there are some evidence suggested ROS production in um, cyclic-induced cell death. To test if ROS is involved in CD52-induced cell death, we use a ROS scavenger, APDC, so the cells incubated with different concentration of APDC and then exposed to high concentration of CD52. And CD52-induced cell death did not alter by APDC. Moreover, an intracellular calcium chelator, BAPTA, did not alter CD52-induced cell death. Together, this data suggests that CD52-induced cell death is independent of ROS production and disruption of calcium homeostasis. We also investigate the potential role of death receptor in CD52-induced cell death by using bone marrow derived macrophages from TNF receptor 1 knockout mice compared with control. And again, CD52-induced cell death in these mice compared with control, which suggests that CD52-induced cell death probably is independent of death receptors like TNF receptor 1. As I showed you before, CD52 increased phosphorylation of P38 and junk. 
to verify the role of these pathways in CD52-induced cell death, we uh, tested the effect of different inhibitors, three different inhibitors for P38 MAP kinase and inhibitors for ERK and JOINC pathway with different concentrations. But none of these inhibitors alter CD52-induced cell death, which suggests that cell death probably is independent of these pathways. So to summarize this part of the talk, high concentration of CD52 induced cell death of innate immune cells, whereas low concentration of CD52 do not cause cell death, but still suppress cytokine production. CD52 mediated cell death induction and impaired cytokine secretion are separable events. Cell death at least in part is caspase dependent. And CD52 induced apoptotic cell death is independent on ROS, MAP kinase, ERK, and JOINC pathways. Very important question left to uh, ask was Does soluble CD52 suppress innate immune responses in vivo? To test the in vivo effect of CD52, we chose sepsis to a study. I would like to take a few minutes to explain why sepsis is important for us. As you know, sepsis and uh, septic shock affect millions of people worldwide with a mortality rate ranging between 30 and 50 percent, which made it the tenth leading cause of death. Sepsis induced by pathogen invasion, which uh, leads to migration of, uh, migration of neutrophils and monocytes to the periphery, and also invasion of the pathogens to the blood, which can induce exaggerated cytokine and chemokine release and formation of reactive oxygen and nitrogen species. In severe cases, it can induce systemic inflammatory response syndrome, or SIRS, which may induce leakage syndrome, which is associated with increased capillary permeability and reduced organ perfusion. This can induce multi-organ failure and death. Current therapies for sepsis consist of broad-spectrum antibiotic and supportive therapy, including fluid resuscitation, mechanical ventilation, and vasopressors to sustain tissue perfusion and blood pressure. But despite recent improvement in supportive therapy, patients with severe sepsis frequently die. This must be due to inability of the current treatment to attenuate systemic inflammatory response syndrome or SIRS. Based on this, many clinical trials have tested new therapeutic approaches to modulate the host response to reduce morbidity and mortality of sepsis. Some of those include a removal of plasma pro-inflammatory mediators by hemofiltration, anti-endotoxin therapy using glucocorticoids, anticoagulants, anti-cytokine therapies, mostly anti-TNF-alpha and IL-1-beta, toll-like receptor inhibitors, mostly TLR4 inhibitor eritoran, and inhibition of HMG1 by antibodies. For example, here, there are clinical trials with TNF inhibitors from 1995 to 2004, which use different antibodies and soluble receptors. But unfortunately, none of these trials could improve the outcome of patients with sepsis. And accordingly, at the moment, there is no FDA approve a specific drug for treatment of sepsis in clinical setting, and severe sepsis and septic shock desperately seeking treatment. One of the reasons for this disappointing result of clinical trial may be a functional redundancy and overlapping between different receptors and their ligands. Because the effect of CD52 is very broad and happens very fast, we aim to test the effect of CD52 in an in vivo model of sepsis. For that, Black six mice aged 8 to 10 weeks injected CD LPS IP along with CD52 IV. Mice were followed for five hours. Body temperature and clinical signs were determined hourly. And after five hours, mice were calved. As shown here, treatment of mice with CD52 significantly reduced TNF alpha release in response to LPS at different time points compared with controlled mice. Moreover, hypothermic response significantly reduced compared with the controlled mice in different time points and also 
CD52 treated mice showed fewer signs of sickness. Besides TNF, CD52 also suppressed the level of other pro-inflammatory cytokines like IL-1 beta, IL-6, and also chemokines like MIP-1 alpha and MIP-1 beta. So together, this data suggests that CD52 treatment reduced pro-inflammatory response and uh, clinical manifestation of LPS injection. Looking at blood count, it appeared that LPS-induced uh, uh, lymphocyte depletion was similar in CD52-treated mice compared with control mice. However, the number of mon monocytes and neutrophils were relatively higher in CD52-treated mice compared with control mice, <coughs> which this data may suggest less migration of these cells to the periphery due to attenuation of inflammation. Moreover, infiltration of F4 AD macrophages was significantly lower in CD52 treated mice in kidney, liver, and lung compared with control mice. So, to summarize this part of the talk, in response to LPS challenge, CD52 inhibits cytokine and chemokine secretion, clinical signs, and tissue macrophage infiltration. So, proposed mechanism for CD52 still need to be clarified further. But uh, generally, because uh, CD52 inhibits multiple TNR, TLR and TNF receptor signaling pathway, it is possible that CD52 inhibit a common molecule or a common event involved in different signaling pathway, like an E3 ligase or a tyrosine kinase, which need to be investigated further. Moreover, cyclics do not have this domain, so they cannot activate caspases directly. They need to engage and activate caspases through another molecule. On the other side, caspase 8 and 9 can be activated through dephosphorylation. So it is possible that phosphatases, rather than SHIP1, is involved in CD52-induced cell deaths independent of NF-CoV inhibition. The other possibility is CD52 suppress basal transcription factor activation and reduce expression of pro-survival protein, which can induce apoptosis as well. These possibilities need to be investigated further. So these results allow us to conclude that soluble CD52 is a negative regulator of innate immune system. And soluble CD52 cyclic interaction suppresses cytokine production through inhibition of NFKV and ERK activation. Soluble CD52 at high concentration induces apoptotic cell death, which is associated with processing of both extrinsic and intrinsic initiator caspases. And soluble CD52 attenuates the inflammatory response and tissue injury following LPS challenge. Regarding to future work, molecular details of the signaling pathways that underlie soluble and, and membrane-bound CD52-mediated suppression and cell death remain to be clarified. Moreover, soluble CD52 seems a therapeutic candidate for a range of innate immune inflammatory disorders in which cytokines play a major role. This needs to be investigated further by proper animal models and also in other models of sepsis. So, there are a lot of people involved in this project. First of all, I would like to take the opportunity to thank my primary supervisor, Len. Without him, um, without his great support and um, supervision, this work would not have been possible. And I would like to thank my second supervisor, James, who provided fundamental help and great support at every point of this project. And I would like to thank my third supervisor, John, my advisory committee, Ian and Helen, all of the people from Harrison Lab, especially Yusha, Esta, and Gaetano, and also people from Vince Lab, especially Kate and Nufi. Seth provided us uh, mutaten bone marrow drive macrophages. Sandra, Laura, and Ed are helping us for some protomics study, which I haven't talked about that today. Tracy and Paul help us for immunohistochemistry analysis. 
Willy John uh, helped me in designing some experiments, and Emma, for all of her kind helps. Ifan did um, mouse polo all of the mouse biplex for us. People from Wo and Six Lab, especially Nima, Nij, and Catherine, provided lots of material and good comments. Robert, he did uh, uh, long scoring, which I haven't talked about that today again. Warren provided us SOX3 deficient mice. Philip uh, provided us BCL2 transgenic mice. Again, I haven't talked about that today. Michael is helping us to get uh, some uh, caspase 9 deficient max. I do thank animal facility, especially Mer and Daniel, for in vivo uh, studies. Uh, and VHI facility facts and histology and also CSIRO, especially Tim and Leslie for recombinant CD52, and my funding body, Melbourne University, to provide my scholarship and VHI to provide such a great environmental research. And last but not the least, my family and friends who give me a great support throughout this journey, and thank you for your attention. In most cases, uh, fat is uh, involved in the activation of caspase 8. So have you looked at fad? And if you think fad might be involved, how do you think fad could be activated? Uh, I haven't looked at fat, but because uh, caspase 9 is activated as well, I don't think fat can cas activate caspase 9. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. But um, yeah, I haven't, I haven't tested that, yeah. I, I don't think it's just extrinsic apoptotic pathway because when I'm using caspase l 3 deficient bone marrow drive macrophages, it still cells die. But your your uh, RIP3 caspase 8 double knockouts, yeah. they were completely resistant, is that right? No. No, you, you still can, and there is a reduction, significant reduction, but not 100%. Okay. Yeah. Um, what is the difference between the end link glycan structure between the CD24 and CD52? Uh, if the peptide doesn't play its role, what makes the difference? One is effective, one is not effective when they are. Definitely, they have difference in the carbohydrate. For example, um, CD24, uh, I think that, uh, I mean, completely the structure of carbohydrate is different, but exactly I don't know what's the difference. Are there cyclic gene knockout mice? There, there are cyclic gene knockout mice, but uh, I haven't uh, found the, in the pool down, I haven't got cyclic G, I got cyclic E. So we are going to look at uh, um, uh, cyclic E deficient uh, mice. We're going to, to do the in vivo study first, like using bone marrow drive macrophages, treat them with CD52 to see if we can inhibit the effect. So, so do you have any data to suggest that the cell death pathway is also through cyclic? I try to, to a different yeah. I try to pull down um, caspase eight with CD52, uh, but because caspase eight and CD52 has the same molecular weight, I couldn't detect if there is the interaction. But uh, the direct uh, interaction of the cyclex or caspase, no, I don't have. It. <coughs> I, I still. Do. Um. In the beginning, when you were looking at the uh, inhibitory effects, you showed that NF kappa B and JONK were uh, re reduced. Yeah. But but quite interestingly, uh, your P thirty eight, which is often required for for this type of signaling, was actually increased as far as sure. I'm And yeah. also JONK. Sure. So yeah. what, what do you think is going on there? Uh, I'm not really sure. Maybe they are compensatory mechanism. They, they try to, because it inhibits ERK pathway and inhibit NFKV, maybe they just compensate the inhibition by upregulation. But I haven't had any success with the inhibitor, so I don't know yet. And you've tried P38 inhibitors? Or? Yes, I tried three different P38 inhibitors. And what did they do? Uh, they inhibit NFKV. Uh -huh. I look at the um, reporter, NFKV reported THB1 cells. They inhibited NFKV and they didn't have any effect on the suppression of CD52 or cell death, both. Thank you. Thank you. 
Sure. Um, this may seem almost academic since the um, peptide portion is only 12 amino acids, but can you can you reconstitute the suppressive effect using just a pure carbohydrate fraction? Um. <laughs> We, uh, we didn't have the carbo. I don't know if we can have the carbohydrate fraction separately without the peptide. Okay. Okay. When you split it, um, we can have the soil. Um, so, I mean, um, the tricky thing to do it works fine, but the carbohydrate needs to be attached to the peptide for it to be able to be part of the sequence. Yeah, we yeah. found that you found that. I think we found that the B cells do. Yeah, yeah. We don't. I don't know about the carbohydrate. If we, uh, there are some uh, cellulose that they can, like the alpha two three, alpha two six, which have shown that they can inhibit LPS um, induced cytokines. Mm, but the, if we haven't tried the um, the sole carbohydrate. I guess the corollary to that is: Do you know anything about the valency of that interaction? Like, I guess your, your CD52FC is down there, presumably, but then you can cut the FC off and you still get the effect. Sure, yeah. Is the naturally secreted um, <coughs> soluble CD52 from the GCI cut on there, one of the ones? Do you know what form that's in? Um, I think it's one of Eric. I'm not sure. Maybe, uh, we'll, I mean, we purified the native one and looked at its release from the cells. I'm just thinking I would not reduce in general. I mean, it wouldn't matter if it was reduced or not reduced actually, frankly. So I guess they tried it. So it mainly comes out of about 20 to 30, so it doesn't look so it's Or a bit higher than that, actually. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure, but I don't think it's a problem in the number state, although you might expect it to something. The carbohydrate of both 52 and 24 really is not, not very well um, worked out in terms of its structure. It's only that one early paper. But um, we'll have the structure on that. I had um, Anne Bell at Imperial College in London, so I've already given us a structure for the C52 SE um, molecule and we'll get the native molecule in very strong. And we've got some cyanocytes which mimic that you know, structure as well. Anyway, it's not my presentation, it's, <laughs> it's Marion's. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the results you showed us at the end, where the, um, the CD52FC was able to um, uh, significantly impair the septic shock in the LPS mice, that, that seems like a fantastic result. So presumably um, this part of the work needs to be developed further. What are the plans for um, what, what needs to be done before you know, people start talking about clinical trials? Um, I think that they are just preliminary experiments. We definitely need to uh, look at um, other model of sepsis as well, and also look at the kinetic and the, the proper dose which can induce all of this suppression, and um, the other like side effects, uh, <coughs> spending longer time to look at the organ injury and this kind of kinetic so study. <coughs> I'm thinking uh, like the CLP, which is a uh, uh, mm, uh, clip and puncture. That one, uh, you can have the bacterial infection as well, which is maybe mimic the human sepsis better than LPS-induced sepsis. But because for us, uh, hyperinflammatory stent was really important, I think that for a starting, LPS-induced sepsis was a good model to start. Because we believe that if we can inhibit the steers or hyperinflammatory state, uh, we can um, prevent the immunoparalysis and cell deaths which happen later in the sepsis model. Um, so you showed that it inhibits the toll-like receptors in your pattern recognition. Did you know if it inhibits any of the intracellular receptors like viral sensors or? Uh, it, um, yes, uh, for example, I think I showed about CPG. Yes, but what about like a viral sensor? Like um, I haven't looked at those actually. 
I'm more I know. Really nice talk. So, you know, the CD2452 had the same receptor. Do you have some ideas why CD24 is not working or whether you use anti signaling 10, you'll get similar results? Yeah. So there are, actually there is a very interesting question and there is a paper published recently which they showed that, for example, uh, cyclic E and some other cyclics, uh, they are interacted with uh, TLRs, like TLR for other TLIs at STDS state, and when TLRs are activated, they dissociate from the cyclics and maybe they induce the inhibition like that. But they couldn't find, for example, the interaction between TLR4 with cyclic G. So so because of that cyclic G had no effect on LPS induced cytokine pro pro production while cyclic E has. So that's, that's why the, there is a difference between cyclic G and CD24 and CD52. They have the same receptor like cyclic 10 in humans. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Cyclic 10 can interact with uh, uh, TLRs. Um, Maybe it's more than one receptor. Maybe CD52 interact with more than one cyclex. Miriam's got some studies on MS um, work, so maybe we will find more things in all the other things we've got as we've got in the time end. I think that's the hope that we can see the other things a bit better uh, with you know, more sensitive MS lately. Well, Mary, I'm sure you're uh, pleased to have done that and you did a great job and uh, you can feel very pleased with yourself. I think uh, we should all congratulate you. Thank you.